This week on Obsessed with Wine. The last statistics were done in 2017, and they found that the wine industry in Texas is a $13.1 billion industry. Texas is also the number one cotton producing state. It's about twice what it is uh, with the wine in the wine industry. But the, the difference is the acres under vine and the acres that are required for that kind of cotton production. For cotton, it's about 5 million acres. And then the wine production acres under vine is more like, you know, 5,500 to 6,000 acres. Hello, fellow wine enthusiasts. My name is Wesley Cable. Welcome to another episode of Obsessed with Wine. When people think of Texas, they usually don't think of the wines. But that's starting to change. Texas is an emerging wine country with its wines winning numerous awards and competitions all over the world. In the 2021 San Francisco Chronicle Wine Competition, one of the most prestigious wine competitions held every year, Texas wines finished with an amazing 57 gold medals, 14 double gold medals, and an astonishing 11 Best of Class Award winners. Remember, in order to get a Best in Class Award, all of the judges in the competition have to agree that your wine is the best in that particular class. So with all this great wine being produced in Texas, I found myself asking, why do I never hear anything about these great wines here in California? Why do I not see any Texas wines on the shelf at my local wine shop, especially when they carry wines from all over the world? As a fan of wine from everywhere, I decided to try and get some answers to these important questions and dive deep into wine made in Texas. Tonight, I have the pleasure of sitting down and talking Texas wine with the talented Shelley Wilfong. Shelley Wilfong is a decorated Texas wine writer, Texas wine judge, and host of the award-winning wine podcast, This is Texas Wine. Shelley and I discuss her passion for Texas wine and what skills are required to be a wine judge in a wine competition. We also discuss the great varieties that do really well in Texas and the best places to visit when visiting the Texas wine country. Pour yourself a glass of your favorite wine. It's time for Obsessed with Wine. All right, so let's get started right away here then. I want to start out first by congratulating you on an award that you won recently, uh, the 2022 Texas Wine and Grape Growers Association Wine Press Award. What is that award and what does it mean to you? It must be a pretty big honor, especially for you. Yes, that award was a very nice surprise. The Texas Wine and Grape Growers Association is, of course, the group that represents the growers of the Texas wine grapes. So that group has an award that they give annually for somebody that's helping to share the word of Texas wine. And that was me this year. So I don't know um, that the podcaster scene is very hot in Texas, but I've been doing it for almost two years now and was happy to receive that honor. Well, wow, that's excellent. So let me start with you just a little bit first. So where did your passion for wine come from originally, and specifically Texas wine? So I fell in love with wine, or I got really curious about wine is probably a better way to put it. Just because I got tired of going out to restaurants and being handed a wine list and having really no idea anything that was on the list, I didn't know wine growing regions, and I didn't even know where to start. And that was frustrating because I've always really enjoyed you know, dining out and fine wine, even, you know, fine dining. But I decided one year with some friends that I wanted to know more about wine. And we thought that the best way to learn about wine was to go to California. And so we went on a trip and we hit both Napa and Sonoma. And I would say from my very first tasting at a winery, I got the bug just to know more and more and more. And I remember specifically where that was. It was in downtown Napa at a little tasting room called, it's not there anymore, it moved, but it's Olabisi Winery. And Ted Osborne is the owner and winemaker, and he was doing the tasting. And I heard all these terms that I didn't really understand, but I just couldn't 
wait to find out everything that there was to know about wine, which is a lifetime journey, of course. But that that's where it really started. I knew that I wanted to read books about wine, talk to people about wine, taste wine, travel to wine regions. And so that's what I started doing. Wow, that's great. So originally, did you have a career doing something totally different and then it kind of transitioned into doing what you really wanted to do, which was doing wine? Well, I did have a career that has nothing to do with wine. I was doing various, I have an MBA and a background in healthcare consulting and also in development in the healthcare area. So I left that um, when my kids were pretty small and I knew that I never wanted to go back to that. So I don't know that this is the career at the level that I had before, but I'm definitely doing something that I really enjoy and I'm doing some different things too, of course, podcasting, writing, and teaching. So it's a nice, well-rounded approach to wine, I think. So you definitely went out and got some pretty high-level, I guess, certifications and education in wine, uh, the WSET Level 3, and I've talked to other people about that. How difficult is that to, to go through the whole process, take whatever the exam is at the end, and, and to, to get that? Uh, Tell me about that a little bit. It's certainly not easy. I actually started just doing a lot of self-study. First, I signed up for the Wine Spectator online wine school, and I took it very seriously. I went and bought a couple cases of wine, as you're instructed to do, and then set up all the lessons for myself. And then I decided, okay, I did that. Now what's the next thing? And I decided that was the Certified Specialist of Wine designation. And so that's also self-study. And so I had done a lot of studying by the time I got to WSET. And so I was ready for it. But what was special about the WSET experience is that it's not just book learning, but you're actually getting to taste with an instructor. And I live in Dallas, and there is a phenomenal master of wine here that taught my WSET courses, Dela Kaner. And she's just a phenomenal teacher, especially when it comes to tasting. And so I really enjoyed learning from her, but also meeting a bunch of great wine people along the way, many of whom are still in my tasting group today. That's great. So then when did it become a career, I guess? After you finished your education and then it's like, okay, now I'm going to start this career doing what you're doing now, I guess, writing and all that. Well, during my class, I was meeting people that had really interesting positions within the wine industry. Some of them were teaching and some were big time wine writers, some were bloggers. And I figured that there was probably something I could do in wine, but I wasn't quite sure what it was. And then one day I saw, and and let me just say that the WSET program really doesn't even touch on Texas whatsoever. So I had, I had had Texas wine at that point, but it was definitely not my focus. And it wasn't honestly something that I drank regularly. I was still very much um, focused on California and really wines around the world, certainly, but not necessarily the wines in my own backyard. But during the WSET course, I saw an online Facebook post from someone who runs a website in the state of, it's called Texas Wine Lover. And it's kind of a a website that includes not only vineyard listings for all the vineyards in the state, but wineries around the state, travel reports, all kinds of great information for Texas wine specifically. And he was looking for someone in the Dallas area to attend events and to write about them for his website. And I said, sure, I can do that because I, I've always been comfortable writing, although I've never really been paid to write. And so I started getting involved in Texas wine. And I realized that I had been wasting time looking only at wines outside of Texas because there was some some great wine being made in Texas. And then I I realized it was a dynamic industry. And um, from there, it's just been a whirlwind of learning about Texas wine. So why is it you think that Texas wine is not talked about as much, I guess? Is it just outside of Texas it's not talked about? Or even in Texas, is it? kind of a subject that's not talked about as much. And why is that? Well, I think it's changing. And I've heard that this is certainly the case, just like in California in the 70s, people in California weren't drinking California wine, they were drinking European wine. So it's the same thing happening here. Um, But the tide is definitely turning both inside the state and outside. There are a number of super diehard Texas wine fans, which is fun. But then outside of 
the state, there are also sommeliers across the country and probably the world that are interested in what's going on here. I think, you know, Texas has a very long wine history, but some people still consider it an emerging wine region. And there's always interest in what is going on in wine regions outside of you know, the top few states that you always think of first. So I see here too that you, it says that you did a little wine educating. So does that mean working in like a tasting room or something or, or a different kind of educating? A different kind. I've never actually worked in a tasting room, but I started holding my own wine tasting events and putting together events for people and businesses, any kind of group really. And then ultimately, I ended up forming an organization called the Dallas Women's Wine Club and got together a group of women that, that want to be a little more serious about wine education. So we meet regularly. We've been a little bit on a hiatus because of COVID, but we just learn about wines of the world and have different themes. You know, around the holidays, we'll do all sparkling wines. We focus on a certain country, all kinds of different themes. Is the wine tasting group about developing a palate for wine or is it more of enjoying different kinds of wines from all over the world or is it a mixture of both? I'd say it's a mixture of both. There are so many women that control the wine purchases in for their homes and in their families. And I think they want to feel more confident. They want to know what to look for. We talk about picking wine off of a list at a restaurant, but also shopping for wine at wine shops. We do a lot of pairing discussions and tastings. So I think everyone, no matter your gender, wants to feel like a confident consumer when it comes to wine. And so often it's a little more difficult than it should be. So whatever people's needs are, we try to just help them kind of get over the hump and um, move forward toward their wine purchases with confidence. So another thing I saw was for you that you also volunteer for Texom, which is a international wine awards, I guess, a competition there in Texas. So what is that? To me, it sounds like just this huge international wine competition, kind of like you'd see all over the place. Is that what it is? And, and what does that mean to Texas? Well, it's a couple of different things. And The first way that I got involved in Texom is that there's a beverage symposium that happens every fall, and I started attending that just as a regular person wanting to learn about wine. And so there are all kinds of different seminars that focus on everything from the wines of New York State to understanding acidity in wine, but it's a very high-level conference. Um, And so I started going to that, and then I understood that there was also a competition that you're speaking of. And that takes place in the spring. So I started volunteering for that competition. And yes, it's just like all the big competitions that that you've heard of. Um, generally, the same people who are speakers at the professional symposium are also the judges. And I'm not a judge at Texom, but I help on the production side of things. It's really fun. Uh, it is very hard work. And it's for multiple days at a time. So everything has to go extremely smoothly. There's so many checks and balances in place. Every wine that comes in is treated very carefully to make sure that it is flighted with appropriate wines so that it can be tasted and judged by the judges. There's a lot to it, but it is great fun. And it's fun to be around other people that are that are super into wine. So as far as judging is concerned, it, I, I did see that you're a judge for one of the a wine, some kind of competition, the Texas Wine and Grape Growers Association Lone Star International Wine Competition. So what's it like being a judge and what are some important skills that you have to have to be a good wine judge? Wine judging is hard. I know it might sound glamorous, but it is very difficult to keep a fresh palate for one thing, but also to move quickly. I found that that was the hardest part for me because I'm used to, when I write about wine, I sip on the same two ounces for an hour and a half. With wine judging, you have to move very quickly. So it's difficult. And some people have a particular sensitivity to one issue. I mean, the big joke is that winemakers on your panel have absolutely no tolerance for certain, maybe like a little Brett. So Brett and wine can give some complexity, but if you have a winemaker on your panel, they're just probably going to hate it and know that's never okay. Mm -hmm. So there's always a little bit of interpersonal dynamics that go into it too. So I enjoy doing it. And I have judged at the Lone Star Wine Awards that Twiga puts on, the Texas Wine and Grape Growers Association, as well as for a nearby town that just started a wine competition 
And then this summer, for the first time, I'm going to judge at the Finger Lakes International Wine Competition. So I'm interested in in doing it and I enjoy it, but it's not as easy as it may sound. So if you're doing a judging on a competition, how many, how does it work? Do you do a certain amount of wines in a certain amount of time? And how do you keep your palate fresh and not ruin it after the first few wines? You usually have a flight that is served in front of you that would be, for instance, you know, dry rosés, and they would be arranged in order of, if they're all dry, then by alcohol percentage. And so maybe you have six of them. And so you're going to taste through individually. Different competitions have different standards of how you're going to rank them. But you're going to taste each wine, and each wine is judged on its own merit. And of course, you spit 100%. And Then as a group, you're probably on a panel with four or five other people, and then you'll go through and discuss each wine individually. People will share their impressions. And then, like I said, the judging is done differently, but you have to come to a consensus as a panel on how that wine will be rated. And then after that flight is done, then you need to work on cleansing your palate. So usually you're served some bread, some celery, maybe some roast beef. And sparkling water is the key for me. Just keep that sparkling water, refreshes the palate. Interesting. That's good. That's a good tip. So as a wine judge, have you ever run into a wine that you just could not handle? There are some wines that smell so bad that I don't even want to taste them, to be honest. Okay. Okay. (laughs) Um, You know, there are a few and far between, but certainly. And all kinds of different companies and winemakers enter these wine competitions There are some times when you will get a bad bottle, and usually there's a backup bottle that is poured into a fresh glass, and so you can identify, was there a problem with that bottle, or is that just the wine? (laughs) Right. Interesting. It's it's always an adventure. So let's start talking about Texas wine now, just specifically. Uh, Just in looking at and doing some research on it, I was fascinated by Texas wine just because I grew up here in California, and like you were saying earlier... My focus has pretty much been on my whole life, just California wines and not even for some reason, considering how other places in this in, all over the world could be growing amazing wine. And it's just fascinating to me how similar things are, but how very different each state is on, on making wine. So I did see a couple of things. One thing, there was a term used, it's called Texas pride, and it was describing kind of the wine world in Texas. What does that really mean? Is that just... Because I know Texans, just for the most part, are very passionate about all things Texas, pretty much. Is that kind of what it has to do with? Yeah, people uh, say that Texas and Texans have a great sense of state pride. Now, I will say that in some ways, it doesn't extend to Texas wine. People love Texas beer and Texas barbecue and, you know, many things. But sometimes wine is not necessarily lumped in with all those other things. So we're trying to change that. So I also saw a quote from somebody, and it may have been on one of your podcasts that you were reading about. Uh, somebody said that Texas wine, or maybe one part of Texas wine, is Napa 30 years ago. Is that really how they look at it? Or in what area is that? The person who said that is a Napa-based wine consultant that is taking a job in Texas. And there have been a number of people from California that are coming to Texas and doing kind of consulting jobs for different wineries. And and he did say that. So I haven't had the opportunity to meet him yet to have him expand on that idea. I think what he means is that there's just a lot of opportunity. Of course, there's a lot of land in Texas There's a lot of resources here. There's a lot of money flowing into the state and money that's already here and an interest in seeing the industry grow. And that was one thing I was going to ask you about people moving in from other states, specifically California or other states where they grow wine and getting into Texas. Why are they going to Texas? And how do the people who live there or are from Texas feel about this influx of people coming from other places? Well, they come here because there are a lot of jobs in wine. And so we definitely want people who want to work in wine to come. There are plenty of opportunities. There are opportunities for growing grapes and opportunities in wineries all over the place. The people that are here, of course, you want great people to move to the state. What there has been some backlash against is that people who want to come into Texas and specifically set up tasting rooms, but with wines from another place. So there is a sense that Texas wine should be made with Texas fruit. 
period. And the Texas legislature has just made it a little easier to tell what is in your bottle. There's been, for the past several years, some efforts to tighten up our labeling law because the labeling law for Texas wine was just the national standard, the national rule, but not any more specific. And other states like Washington, Oregon, California have more stringent rules around that. Now we're really getting focused on 100% Texas fruit and Texas wine. Okay. So I sit, I saw that as far as the breakdown of reds and whites, about 70% reds grown, about 30% whites. Does that sound about accurate? That's about right. Okay. And so what are some challenges of growing grapes and producing wine that are unique to just Texas? Well, I should mention that about 75% of the grapes grown in Texas are grown in a specific AVA that's in the northwest part of the state. It's called the Texas High Plains, and it's an area that is about 8 million Now I'm forgetting if it's square miles or acres. I need to check that. Okay, (laughs) It's a very, very large AVA. Mm -hmm. And the interesting thing about that AVA is that it's at a pretty high elevation. The vineyards planted there at about 3,500 square feet. And then they go up from there up to about 4,000 feet in elevation. 3,500 to 4,000 feet of elevation. Um, You'll find the vineyards there. It sits on a high mesa. So it's very flat but it's high. So there's a large diurnal shift. Now that is not the area where most of the wineries in Texas are though. Mm -hmm. So a lot of traditional row crop farmers have diversified into growing grapes in the past, you know, 20, 30 years. And so, like I said, about 75% of our grapes are grown out there. And then often they are trucked into the Texas Hill Country, which is more in the central part of the state. And that's really where a lot of the wineries are located and where a lot of the tourism is. The challenges out in that area are weather related. They are late spring frosts. And on occasion, for instance, in 2019, there was a Halloween frost. So the grapes had been harvested and they were not shut down for winter. And so there was a lot of damage for a fall frost event. Mm -hmm. There's also hail, a lot of hail. So people are having to put up hail nets and take some precautions that way, which is, of course, expensive. Yeah. Wow. So I also saw that in Texas, it contributes, I guess, a lot to the state as far as economic value. I mean, is it pretty big as far as what it brings to the state overall? The last statistics were done in 2017, and they found that the wine industry in Texas is a $13.1 billion industry. Wow. So that's huge. Yeah. It, Texas doesn't have as long of a history with wine as it does with cotton. Texas is also the number one cotton producing state. Mm-hmm. And the size of the cotton crop, as far as economic value, is about twice what it is uh, with the wine in the wine industry. But the, the difference is really in the acres under vine and the acres that are required for that kind of cotton production. For cotton, it's about 5 million acres. And then the wine production acres under vine is more like, you know, 5,500 to 6,000 acres. Wow. Interesting. So what is what are some varietals that grow really well in Texas? Well, that's an interesting topic because Texas is as big as France, if you can believe that. Yeah. And so when you think about France, you don't just think about, you know, one red and one white. There are certain grapes that grow well in different regions. So when the Texas wine industry was a bit newer, some people tried to say, okay, this is going to be the state grape. It's going to be Tempranillo. And that's, we're going to, you know, hang our hat on Tempranillo. Well, now people are realizing There are so many different growing regions and vineyard sites across the state. You can't just say this is the one thing. Mm -hmm. I can tell you what are the top five um, planted red grapes. Mm -hmm. They are Cab Sauv, Cabernet Sauvignon, Tempranillo, Merlot, Morvedra, and Sangiovese on the red side. On the white side, our number one white is called Blanc de Bois, and it's a hybrid variety that was developed in the 60s in Florida. And it can be made as a dry white wine, a sweet white wine, sparkling, a dessert wine, you name it, mm-hmm. Blanc de Bois. And then uh, Viognier, Muscat Canelli, Chardonnay, and Riesling. Interesting. Now, you know, of course, it's hot in Texas. And so a lot of Mediterranean varieties do well here because we get the heat that they need to ripen. And so 
regardless of the ones I just named, I think that people are realizing that a lot of the warm climate grapes do quite well here. So what I see here too is you mentioned that most of the grapes, and you talked about 80%, 75%, 80% are grown in that one area, Texas High Plains. Why is that? Is it just a matter of that's a good place as far as the to grow grapes and the other, the rest of the state isn't? Or is it just it hasn't made its way to some of those other areas? I think that there are a number of reasons why the Texas High Plains is the main area. And one is because it is already an agricultural area where all those row crop farmers were already farming. And so it was pretty easy to trans translate what they were doing to grapevines. And it's set up for mechanical harvesting. It's very flat. It gets plenty of sun. It's got the nice ironal shift. And the soils are great. They're iron rich, uh, red sandy loam soils. The other parts of the state have some other challenges. There are grapes grown in many, many places, even down by the coast. But you run into disease pressures there, various types of mildew. That's why the Blanc du Bois is generally grown in the more humid areas. So East Texas and down by the coast in South Texas, because that is resistant to Pierce's disease, which is one of the biggest disease pressures. And um, that's really one of the great varieties that can withstand the pressures there. There is definitely more and more interest in growing grapes in the Texas Hill Country, which is the area where a lot of wineries are located. And it is more in the central part of the state. It is west of Austin which is a big area um, for job growth and population center. And the vineyards there are generally smaller. There's more diversity of soil type, but also some excellent soil, still warm enough to ripen grapes. And people are planting there in pretty significant numbers, although acres-wise, there's just a lot of land out in West Texas, as you can imagine, in the Texas High Plains. So there's definitely plenty of more room uh, for grapevines in Texas. There's also an area that's of real interest to a lot of people in Texas wine, and it's called the Texas Davis Mountains. It's another AVA. We have eight AVAs, and it is one that has the only volcanic soil in the nation, in the state, the only volcanic soil in the state. And the vineyards there are very high elevation, 5,600 feet. Wow. I took a note on that. I was going to ask you about Texas Davis Mountains, just because I saw how high the elevation was for those grapes. So what do they grow up there? There are a number of things growing out there. Cabernet Sauvignon is one, and Syrah. There is not a lot of vineyard activity out there, but I think that there will be more investment there in the future because it's an, um, an area that the weather is just interesting. The soils are beautiful. And um, I think that a lot of people are interested in seeing how that continues to develop. Hello, Obsessed with Wine fans. I never get the chance to do this, so I wanted to take a minute to thank you for the overwhelming support you've shown me for this show. I tell people all the time, this show would not be successful if it wasn't for the amazing listeners and the great guests we have. To thank you, I've decided to start giving away Obsessed with Wine merchandise and gift cards from wineries I feature on the show. Please go to www.obsessedwithwine.net and sign up for the mailing list like many of you have already. Only as a member of the mailing list will you qualify for these great giveaways. You'll also be able to take advantage of the bonus episodes I plan to release in the near future. Thank you again for your support. I couldn't do this without you. Now back to the interview. So you mentioned Texas Hill Country as being kind of the place where a lot of the wineries are and a lot of where all, a lot of the tourism is. Is that Fredericksburg? Is that in that area? Yes, Fredericksburg is one of probably the prime city that um, a lot of people are familiar with and like to stay there. There's a Highway 290 that runs east-west from Fredericksburg in the west to Johnson City in the east, and it's just winery after winery as you're traveling down that highway. So there's a lot of winery activity, both on that road and um, little towns nearby. So there's definitely plenty to do to 
occupy your time if you're interested in wine tasting down there. And is that why it's so popular is because it's so concentrated with wineries. You can hit a bunch of different places kind of on the same day in the same spot. That's why tourism seems to be growing so much. It's always been a popular tourism spot because Fredericksburg has a very interesting history. It was settled by German immigrants in the 1840s, and there's a lot of German heritage there, uh, restaurants and just a cute downtown. And um, there's also a lot of activity in the summer with peaches. Gillespie County, where Fredericksburg is, is a prime location for peach orchards. So there's a lot of fun outside of wineries, but wineries have definitely increased tourism to the area. So besides the amount of air, the some of the things you just mentioned, what makes Fredericksburg a great place for people to go visit? Is it, I can't imagine what it looks like. Is it just beautiful with a bunch of growth and that kind of stuff? Like, what does it look like? It looks a little bit like the south of France, kind of gentle rolling hills. You know, you think of Texas as being flat and certain parts of Texas are definitely flat, but the hill country is indeed hilly. And so it is beautiful. There are places where you can get just a beautiful vista, beautiful sunsets. It's definitely got a feeling of uh, a lot of the wineries do, you know, high end food and wine pairings. Obviously, I started going to wineries in California before I started really visiting Texas, but it's the same feel. It's a very mm-hmm. high end educational experience. I remember the first time I ever did a tasting in Texas, I thought I didn't have very high expectations, frankly. And so I went and I met with this woman who was the assistant winemaker and turned turns out she's a UC Davis grad in winemaking. I mean, yeah. There's a lot of expertise here and definitely high-end experiences for all kinds of wine lovers. So outside of Fredericksburg, what are some other areas that are popular for people to visit to try what Texas has to offer in wine? Well, if you want to go straight to the source, you should see the vineyards out in the Texas High Plains. And the place to do that is probably to be based in Lubbock, which is a university town. Texas Tech University is in Lubbock, and that's actually one of the places where the wine industry got started in the 70s. And there were some vineyards planted out there that really got things going. And so there are a number of wineries out there, lots of food and wine festivals as well. So that's a possibility. But but honestly, no matter where you are in Texas, there's probably a winery or two within a short drive from you. So from North Texas and the Texoma AVA, which is north of Dallas and Fort Worth, There are beautiful wineries. It's also a really lovely part of the state that are within a drive. You know, a lot of wineries all over the state are getting their grapes from the Texas High Plains, but some also have estate vineyards. And so it just depends on what you're looking for. In East Texas, where you would think that it would be too humid for grapes to grow, there are several wineries that are making grapes from High Plains fruit as well as taking their hand at growing as well. So I I was going to ask you a question, because the state's so big, you really would have to pick one place you would want to go visit and maybe another time go to another place. It's not, they're not close together where you could go to hit a couple of them on on one trip or something like that. Is that right? That's probably true. Yes, it is a big state. (laughs) But you know, if you, if you base yourself in Austin or San Antonio, you can be at a number of premier Texas wineries within 45 minutes to an hour. But the same is the same could be true for Dallas. You may just have a little bit further to drive to be at some of the best wineries in North Texas. So are there any grapes that are unique to Texas? Um, I mentioned Blanc de Bois, the white variety that's a hybrid. I know that Texas is the largest grower of Blanc de Bois. It's not probably 100% unique. Beyond that, I can't think of any. Black Spanish or Lenoir is another um, that is grown some in Texas. But most everything is Vitis vinifera, and it's the same grapes that you see. I mean, there is a lot of varietal diversity in Texas, so we're not just growing a lot of a couple of things. But I have a list here of uh, the varieties by acre from 2020, and there are 65 different varieties on the list, plus a big category of other. So... There's all kinds of stuff growing in Texas and blends are popular too. So you mentioned earlier that Cabernet is one of, is, I guess, the top red that's grown. Obviously here in California, Cabernet is a big, 
is a big crop and it's grown here and a ton of Cabernet is made here. How would you compare a Cabernet from Texas to one from California? Texas is known generally as being a little more old world in style than new world in style. So you're definitely going to get the ripeness. And so, you know, there's not a concern that the grapes aren't going to ripen generally, but it's more of an earthy or rustic. Um, One tasting note that seems to be common in a lot of Texas wines is cedar. Mm -hmm. So although it's aged in, you know, French oak often, just the same as a big Napa cab, uh, it's, I would say, less opulent and more old world style. Okay. That's interesting. So I've, I also saw these great awards that some of these Texas wine producers have been receiving in these competitions. And I thought that was fascinating that, you know, going up against wines from all over the world and and some of these great competitions, specifically, this was a 2021 San Francisco Chronicle wine competition. And according to the results, there were 57 wines from Texas that won gold medals, 14 of of them got double golds and 11 best of class, which is pretty awesome. Yeah. There are awards being won right and left at competitions, national and international competitions. And it's good to see people are um, definitely, you know, when it's blinded and people give Texas wines a chance, it's not always the case if you're, you know, ordering off a wine list and you see that you can have a Texas wine or a California wine. But if, if all things are equal and your wines are blinded, Texas is doing great. So when you're out and about talking to people in other states and other wine regions, and you say, I cover wine and I'm passionate about wine in Texas. What is, what, what is kind of the attitude that people give you? A lot of people in wine, sommeliers, et cetera, are very curious about Texas wine and are anxious to hear what we're doing, what the growing conditions are like, what varieties thrive here, and really appreciate the education. And then when they come here and see it for themselves, they're completely delighted. There are a lot of Texas wine, you know, fanatics all over now because of trips they've taken or tastings that they've done maybe when they've been here for the Texom conference and that kind of thing. I think people in general are are interested and open to new experiences when it comes to wine. We love it when people offer wine by the glass so that you can have just a smaller pour and not commit to a whole bottle if you're unsure. Someone was telling me just the other day that at a restaurant in Dallas, they were out of their by the glass Pinot Noir. And so the, the bartender said, I'd like to pour you another wine that I think you'll like. And they gave them a Texas Morvedra and the person loved it. And then the bartender said, that's actually a wine from Texas. It's a Morvedra. And they were shocked. And of course, they never would have ordered that. Sure. They may not. It turns out they liked it. it. Yeah, that's a good story. So when I asked you about some wines that really represent Texas, you had given me a couple of producers that you felt like, and I'm sure there's a million of them, but that you really felt like represented Texas pretty well. And so I picked up a couple of these wines at Eden Hill Vineyard and uh, a couple of whites I got. And then I've got this red here and forgive me, but I, I'm trying to figure out how to say this and I don't know how to say it. Is it, is it the Alianico? Is that how you say it? Yeah. Alianico. Alianico. Uh-huh. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So I had never heard of that before. And so that was intriguing to me. I just read a little bit of the tasting notes on the website about it. And I was thinking, Oh, that sounds like a really good wine. So, do you, can you tell me about Alianico a little bit? I've never heard of it. Well, it's not super common, but it is in Italy. It's from the boot of Italy, from Southern Italy. And it's a red grape that does quite well in Texas. It's, it's pretty high in tannins. And so I don't, have you tasted it yet? Yeah, I've got some right here. I okay. usually don't okay. drink this early, but I've got, <laughs> I definitely have some going. Yeah. Cause I was, I was, you know, it wanted to experience what it was all about. And so those are kind of things I was thinking about it, just tasting it. You know, it's like with the tannins and all that stuff. It's it's a great wine. So it probably could use some air and a little decanting. So keep it open for and then have it tonight. And I bet it'll be a different experience. I think it's a it's a beautiful wine. There are a couple of major producers in Texas that are um, working with Alianico. And it's it's one of those that, like you said, it's hard to pronounce. But then once you've had it, you're looking for more. Yeah, I'll never forget it. I'll, and I'll keep looking for it for sure, because this is, it's, it's been a good experience so far. And obviously I've only had a little bit. So uh, about, about Eden Hill, though, do you know anything about them do you, as far as what they're all about? What, you know, any, the story behind that, anything like that? 
Yes, I actually had Chris Hornbaker, who's the owner with his parents and sister, and he's also the winemaker, and he was on the podcast a few months ago. And they are up in North Texas, probably 30 to 45 minutes north of Dallas in a little tiny town called Salina. And they do have an estate vineyard there. Seems like they're growing Tempranillo and maybe a couple of things, but I know Tempranillo is primarily what they're doing in their estate vineyard. And they get grapes from the High Plains primarily. I bet the Alianico that you're drinking is from the High Plains. I don't have that. It is. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. So he's doing great things up there. And they're one of the ones that I think have won a number of big awards in San Francisco. And I told him on the podcast, I feel like that he's not very good at tooting his own horn because that's a winery that people in Texas should definitely be paying attention to. But they're out of the main kind of tourist area of the whole country. And so people in the Dallas Fort Worth area are probably a little more familiar with them than just the state as a whole. Yeah, I see his name on the bottle here. It says uh, winemaker Chris Hornbaker. So yeah, a nice wine. Very nice. I like the I like to read tasting notes on the back and that's got a really nice tasting note there. Talks about some of the qualities that you should get maybe out of tasting the wine. And then it has a food pairing, which is cool. As far as you're concerned, you cover all of Texas. How do you do that? How do you cover everything for your podcast and your writing and all that? How do you do that? Well, it's really tricky, honestly, because it's a big state and there are all kinds of different wineries and wine people. So I try to have people on the podcast from all over the state. So I've had people from Texoma in the north part of the state. I just had someone from Galveston County down um, along the beach who's growing down there. And then, I, of course, I have a lot of people from the hill country and a few from out west in the Texas High Plains. So there's some there's a story everywhere, but there are also different stories based on winery size and based on if someone's a winemaker or winery owner or, you know, other media covering the industry. So I just try to try to hit it all. But it's a hard job. Yeah. So you, you mentioned the podcast and I definitely wanted to talk to you about that. So the podcast is called This is Texas Wine Podcast. And so one of the reasons I really like the podcast is because it seems like you really care about educating people on just wine in general, not necessarily just Texas wine, but you ha you talk about a lot of things that just are just general wine topics. But obviously there is a a fit focus on, on Texas wines there. So, and I also like the fact that you're not afraid to give your opinions on wines that you like. I think a lot of people are afraid of maybe upsetting people if they give their opinions on certain wines. And so I know on, on the episodes, usually say, this is what I'm drinking. And you talk about a, some wines or something like that. So tell me about, you know, how you started the podcast and, you know, how has it been received there in Texas? Sure. I started the podcast back in June of 2020, so toward the beginning of the pandemic. I actually had a whole nother project in mind that I wanted to do around wine, and it was not a podcast, but it was going to require a lot of face-to-face -face meetings and drinking wine with various people, and I didn't think that it was the best time to kick off that project. And I realized that although there was briefly another Texas Wine podcast, there was not a current podcast. I'm a huge podcast listener. And so a friend of mine is actually a podcast editor. And I asked him how hard it would be to learn how to do a podcast. And he said, it's really not hard at all, even though I'm not super techie, but I did figure it out. And I launched in June of 2020. I thought that my audience would be just general consumers who are interested in Texas wine. But what I found is that I have a lot of people from the Texas wine industry listening different winemakers and um, winery owners have told me that it's not often that they get to hear an hour long conversation with their fellow winemaker at the winery down the street. So there's definitely a lot of um, people in the industry listening, but general consumers too. And I did, I did start out talking about what I was drinking, but what I found is that I get very self-conscious reading my own tasting notes and and then how do I pick the wines that I was drinking? And I just didn't feel quite right. It was never like a sponsored post or anything, but it kind of felt like I was picking favorites. And so 
just, and I never talked about wines I didn't like. So I do try to keep it somewhat positive, but I give something called like demerits and gold stars on the podcast. So I talk about what I see that's going well in the Texas wine industry. And I do gently point out things that aren't going so well, but it's never really to an individual winery. It's things like, why is there a big festival that says it's the best in Texas food and wine, but there's no Texas wine there that would be warranting a demerit. So it's been fun. It's been a really great reception in Texas. And I, I appreciate that. So I also like the fact that you've also had a little segment in the podcast that talks about news from the Texas wine world. So things that are happening, whether it be legislation or other things that are happening and you, you, you do that too. So I, I really like that idea. I think people probably appreciate kind of getting a wrap up of what's going on, current events and that kind of stuff in, in the wine world. Do you get feedback from people that appreciate that stuff? Absolutely. And I think that that is a little bit unique, but I, I do think it's important for people to know how Texas wine is being talked about outside of Texas. And so I try to follow that real closely and just and bring it to people's attention. Sometimes it's good news. Sometimes it's not good news. And and people may disagree on what I include <laughs> or disagree with the way something's been covered. But I think it is important to at least let people know what's being said out there. And that that idea I got because one of the podcasts that I listen to is around Peloton, the, the exercise bike, and uh, uh, one of the podcasts that is a fan podcast starts out with how Peloton shows up in the news. And so I thought, well, I'll do that with Texas wine. Interesting. So is the podcast more successful than you thought it would be? Or like, has it met your expectations or is it beyond your expectations so far? I think it's exceeded my expectations. I wasn't sure who would listen more than once besides my mom. And I wasn't sure if I would want to do it, if it wasn't getting a good reception. So I wasn't exactly sure how long it was going to stick around. But I remember the first time I put out three episodes my first day and I immediately got some feedback on Instagram with someone saying, I've already listened to all three and I love it. Thank you so much. Keep it up. And I, it was somebody I didn't know. <laughs> and so it was just shocking. But yeah, I would say that I definitely um, have been pleased with the reception. And a lot of people are very hungry for more Texas wine news, information they want to hear. It's not uncommon to go to a winery and sit down with the winemaker, but not everyone gets to do it. And so if I'm able to record an hour-long interview with the winemaker that everyone can hear, I think people really appreciate it. Yeah, no, I I definitely think so, too. So I've listened to the show. I like the show. I mean, I'm curious about wine from all over the place. So I like listening to your show. A couple more questions I have for you is as far as things that are coming in soon or in the near future, anything exciting coming to the world of wine in Texas, you know, coming soon that, you know, well, there are new wineries opening up all the time, which is awesome. That's always great to see. Uh, I'm hoping that we'll have some rain. We're in a severe drought right now, and it's uh, not looking so good out there right now. It's uh, We're way, way, way down on water, and uh, our vines are hungry, thirsty, and uh, need some relief. And you may have heard about an issue on my podcast, a rather controversial issue that's going on in the Texas High Plains around uh, the use of a herbicide and uh, called dicamba. And there's a big lawsuit going on right now that um, 57 grape growers in the Texas High Plains have filed suit against the companies responsible for that. Um, it's being used primarily in in uh, cotton fields, and the gra- it's it's doing damage to the grapevines. And so we're awaiting a hearing or some kind of settlement or something. And also the EPA is taking another look at dicamba. So. There are strong feelings on all sides of that issue, but that's something that we have our eye on in Texas as well. Mm -hmm. I did hear that in in one of your episodes. I don't remember which one it was that you you did talk about that. So, all right. So one last question I want to ask you is besides the great wines in Texas that you'd enjoy, what are some wines outside of Texas that you personally really like? Well, I like champagne. (laughs) I like a lot of California wines. I still drink a lot of California wines and I've stayed true to some of those early visits and those early wine clubs that I've joined. I don't know if you want me to name brands, but 
you know, I, I'm really interested in trying a lot of different things. And so I try not to always drink the same thing, but I'm a big fan of Pinot Noir. I love the Sonoma Coast. I love Burgundy. I don't drink that much Burgundy, sadly. I haven't found any Texas Pinot Noirs that scratch that itch for me. So I'm still drinking a good amount of California wine, but I'm, I'm curious about wine. So I, I honestly drink wine from all over the place. It's been an awesome time. I really appreciate you taking the time out of your schedule to come on the show and talk about Texas wine. I feel like I learned a lot. And I feel like a lot of people who listen to my show who aren't versed with in Texas wine will learn a lot and hopefully will go and experience it for themselves, whether it be buying some wine like I did online. And what was funny is I, I, I put on social media, hey, I got my first Texas wines and how excited I was about trying them. And I can't believe how many responses I got from people just saying, oh, I love Texas wine. You should try this. You should try that. Uh, there was a winemaker that I worked with here in California. And he said he gave me a couple suggestions on some great wines from Texas. So it's one of those things that maybe there's more people out there who know about it and like it than, than I hear about. So I thought that was kind That's of great. Well, yeah. I hope that you'll continue to explore Texas. And of course, for your listeners, many, many wineries here ship to California and all over the place. So if you're in a state that allows wine shipments, then Texas wineries can probably ship to you. But I, I enjoyed being with you and I wish you the best with your podcast. Thank you, Shelly, for, for joining me. I appreciate it. Of course. Thank you. <laughs> I want to thank Shelley Wilfong for taking the time to educate us about Texas wine. She's absolutely right. The wines coming out of Texas right now are very good. I encourage you to go online like I did and order some Texas wine for yourself. Remember, don't order wines that include grapes that grow well where you live. Focus on the grape varieties that grow well in Texas. You won't be disappointed. If you want to hear more about Texas wine and Texas wine country travel, look for Shelley Wilfong's podcast. This is Texas Wine, wherever you get your podcasts, or you can go to her website at thisistexaswine.com. Finally tonight, I encourage you to visit the show website at www.obsessedwithwine.net. There you can listen to past episodes of the show and read tasting notes from the wines recommended by the guests who have appeared on previous episodes. I also want you to sign up for the mailing list so you can take advantage of these bonus episodes I'm going to be releasing in the near future. Only those who are part of the mailing list will get access to these bonus episodes. I don't want to see you miss out on anything. You can also join the Obsessed with Wine community on Instagram and Twitter. There we discuss all things wine, share pictures of our wine adventures, and I give updates on upcoming episodes. Thank you, and I will see you next week. Cheers! Cheers!